Become jazz players. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go yeah, into some days. of the recent ones, mm -hmm. I want to go back some years now to Seattle yeah. when a young kid came up to you. He was playing trumpet, he was composing a little. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you were with the Basie Small Combo, and yeah. you said, I can fit you in at six in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> What did you hear in this uh, kid that made you figure to take the time? You worked all night. He was so sincere. He had been there two or three nights in a row, and I'd seen him. He'd seen this little stick figure, yeah. and he kept saying that he was so thin, and he, he was just, uh, just, you know, he was thin. <laughs> <laughs> then... So I finally seen him when he looked at me, and I said, uh, he looked very serious and very sincere. Oh, yeah. I remember you saying you were glad uh, you made time for that kid. I'm so sure glad. Yeah, he, he, could, he could buy all of us and sell us now. <laughs> Many times. Yes, I suppose I'd have said, get out of my face, man. <laughs> then, sometime after that, around the St. Louis area, you heard a kid whose last name was Davis. Well, what, is, what, Davis. Did you, what did you hear in him? Well, his, his teacher, Elwood Buchanan, was a good yeah. But in my, we used to drink beer together. <laughs> and Bill Elwood used to say to me, he, he told me what he said to us at the Lincoln High School. He said to me, Man, you got to come over to school and hear this little Dewey Davis. You're not going to believe it. Dewey was his middle yeah. name. He was, I think he was named after Dewey Jackson. Uh, yeah. I used to think he was named after Dewey Jackson, <laughs> the top top of the and, and Oh, yeah, for the riverboats, yeah. But his dad's name was Dewey also. Uh, so maybe your dad is not as old as Dewey. So, uh, so uh, I, I used to say, well, okay, I'm coming over there. And one day I went over and met this little kid. And he, had this, he was so thin that he could set up to ride a rooster. So he used to, he used to look down all the time. He'd never look up at me. And I'd say, yes, my son. Look up and and drop his head back down again. So when I heard him play, I said, wow, this kid. How old was he about that? He was a teen, uh, maybe 12, 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old. He did just good, got into high school. Now, I just heard that you discovered Nicholas Payton when he was 14 years old. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I was on a tour in Europe, and a guy by the name of... Uh, uh, I can't think of his name at the moment, but yeah. he was a, he was a trumpet player. Yeah. And he had a bunch of little kids from New Orleans that he had taken over to Europe, and they played on street cars and so forth. And Nicholas was a trombone player. Yeah. This this shot, he couldn't know when the world well, he could have reached the seventh position. <laughs> so he was <laughs> there with his, you know, his jamming himself. And uh, I got to know him. He was a nice, beautiful little young kid then. And then I had an occasion to go, which I do from time to time, through cities, and then just we say, let's get all the kids together. So we put together a, a, a thing, like a clinic in uh, New Orleans. Yeah. And here comes this little kid with a trumpet. 
I say, man, you look like this. Yeah, I'm the same one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, he, we, we indulged him in the clinic, and it was a beautiful thing, and all the kids enjoyed it. And that's when I began to know him as a trumpet player. So he's always uh, been like a, a family. You know? Now, there's a new CD out. <coughs> All of Clark Terry's alumni are in it. It's called The Young Titans of Jazz. Oh, yeah. It's on yeah, Hank yeah, O'Neill's yeah. Kiara School. Right yeah, there. Little, little and there. this is a concert you did in Beeren, Switzerland, as I yeah. remember. And they're from all kinds of different countries. Yeah. Including Roy Haynes' grandson, Absolutely. <laughs> who was 16 years old at the time and kicked a big man like he'd been playing for 40 years. Now, yeah. is this the way we're going to get more players because the territory bands aren't around anymore. That's true. There are very few big bands around anymore. You know, some of the guys told me that years ago they'd be on the bus and they'd learn from the older musicians. But yeah. I guess education is the one only way now. That's the only way. <laughs> well, I was fortunate enough to be able to learn a lot from the older musicians because I was not fortunate enough to, to go to college and learn how yeah. to do all the things that the yeah. college kids do. So, I guess one is as good as the other, you know, as long as you can get the results from it, you know. So it, it was a beautiful Now experience. there's going to be at William Patterson College yeah. in New Jersey, it's called the CT Building. Now those yeah. are familiar initials. Yeah. What's going to be in there? Well, it's a performance building, it's a rehearsal, <laughs> practice room, yeah. and it'll be uh, an archive for all of my uh, gatherings. Oh. And there's lots of gatherings. <laughs> I can hardly get in my little house sometimes for all the proclamations and the, the 15 doctors and the pictures and the statues and so forth. Oh. I have to go in carefully like this. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, luckily, it's going to be a beautiful home for all these people. When is that going to open? Well, we just had the first uh, concert to raise some funds with Bill Cosby. But unfortunately, he had some concerts in the area, so he, we had to build it as Bill Cosby's dream band. <laughs> not as, as, as he wanted known to everyone that he was not going to do his routine yeah. uh, that they would be seeing when they pay what they pay for, you know. So he did the, the thing as Bill Cosby's dream band. And he always loved Jimmy Heath. And Jimmy, he's from Philadelphia, where he was from, I think. So he would always have Benny, uh, Benny Green to, I mean, uh, uh, Jimmy Heath to uh, appear. And as Jimmy Heath was taking his solo, it always happened to be just at the time he wanted to take his solo on the flugelhorn. I had given him a flugelhorn, all right, and all of a bit of thing like this, you know, with a band bell, a brand new mouthpiece. And the way this started, on one of his shows on 23rd Street. Uh, there was a crowd of people on the streets. He was walking through with a big case. I said, hey, sir, what are you doing? I'm sitting on the doorstep, uh, you know, those little, you know, those little houses in New York. So I said, I'm going to, I'm going to work here. I said, what do you play? He said, I'm playing the saxophone. I said, a big old case like that? It was a bass clarinet, you know. Uh, so I said, let me, let me play some, come on up here with me. So he came up on the bandstand, on the, on the steps with me. He sat down and whipped out this uh, big uh, bass player, and he said, made a few, <laughs> a few ugly notes. So I said, I looked at him and said, man, you are, you are playing the wrong instrument. You see you play a brass instrument. I said, well, I don't have one, oh my God. I said, well, well, I just happen to have one for you. So I gave him an old, beat-up, long, flugelhorn bubble and a new mouthpiece, and I gave him, put it in a case, and on the case I wrote, Screech Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows who the heck Screech Jones was. No, he is. So he would do this occasionally, he'd come into a club where uh, I'm appearing at you. Yeah making yourself visible. I would say to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, 
If I'm not wrong, I could I could have sworn I saw some screen jobs back there. <laughs> 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 now they don't know who the hell's screen jobs. They couldn't care less, you know. But it must be somebody big, you know. You're know, talking about the screen job. So all of a sudden he makes it possible for me to see that it is screech jobs. He walks through the Oh, I said, that is a screech jobs. Let him sit all of them together the street. So they applaud like they expect something great, you know. So he comes up, and we got to have it all figured out. I was thought that he was starting to get his chops together and blow something, and every time he do that, I'd play something. <laughs> 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 so we made this big thing out of it, and we did one of these shows that way. That particular show that night, yeah. when he came through with the, with the bridge clarinet, and sat down, I said, now you need to, you know, just brass instrument. So you can pucker your lips like this and make a buzz, you know. So we taught how to do the buzz right on the set. And yeah. said, yeah, that's great. So we did the same thing on that set. I said, let's get you play something. So they would take the camera <laughs> off him and, and take the camera off me and put it on him. He'd... <laughs> but I would be playing, you know. They said, wow, this can't be playing, you know. <laughs> I'd like to ask you about another band of youngsters you had up in Harlem oh, yeah. <coughs> before the Jazzmobile. Yes. But that one didn't last very long. That didn't last very long. Because you had to go away. You, you bought them instruments. You got them a place to play with yeah. all kinds of facilities. Yeah. I wrote about this in Jazz Times That's because true. it came out of a book yeah. that Hank O'Neill wrote, and you told him that yeah. story. Yeah. So you had to go away, and you had Kenny Durham and some other people go. Right. When you came back, Somebody had got those kids full of, well, we don't want to hear yeah. anything from Caucasians. Yeah. This is only our music. Yeah, we don't want and, to be And what did you do then? Teaching us our music. Yeah. So here I had made it possible for them to go to Manhattan College. They had classrooms. Yeah. They had uh, videos. They had uh, tapes. and practice rooms and everything. And even instruments. And they, 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 some of these kids never would have seen college if it hadn't been for not, not even seeing it. They yeah. don't even walk down that block, you know. So uh, they got the very, very uh, prejudiced about Whitey teaching them about our music. <coughs> so I said, okay, if that's what you catch feel about it, hell with it. I just gave it up. I said, you got it. I don't even know where the library is anymore. And we had a great library. We had one gentleman who could write uh, like like uh, uh, trombone players and play yeah. and work with Quincy. Uh, Billy, Billy something, I can't tell, I think it was later. She could write a chart in, in, uh, in an hour, a full band chart, you know, just yeah. brruh, 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 write it out. So we had to, uh, people like it. Now this one young man, I don't, I don't think I should call his name. Should I call his name? <laughs> yeah. I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me, he was the one that instigated this donut uh, why did he teach you. Yeah. So I just gave it up. I gave up the whole thing, library and everything. And, uh, did anybody ever hear about those young musicians again? Oh yeah. yeah. Billy Saxon has a house on 133rd Street, 144 East 133rd Street, uh. I figured was a famous block many years ago. Yeah. Uh, Billy Holiday used to sing there. Ah. Uh, Willie the Lion used, oh, yeah. to, used to play there. And uh, it's, it's a very, very historical place. And he bought this house recently through the medium of his wife who was into real estate. Yeah. And a very beautiful lady. They started a new thing there with this house. And they're kind of re trying to recreate that scene of that block the way it used to be many, many years ago. And uh, he's one of the cats, Billy, Billy, Billy Saxon. Sean Gonzalez, the, you know, the, the, what's his trumpet? Yeah. You know, two Jerry. One plays the trumpet? Jerry. Jerry Gonzalez. Jerry Gonzalez and his brother. Andy. Andy. They were two, I like, uh, uh, Miles uh, something, the, the, the 
comes from where. Yeah, yeah. A lot of kids. I tell you, if there ought to be a list of the Clark Terry alumni, it would fill a couple of books. I wish it was possible it could come from a book like that. I don't know because I can't remember back that far. I forget what I go for in the bathroom sometimes. <laughs> Duke Ellington, he said something to me that stayed in my head a lot. He said that Duke never wanted a definite ending. Absolutely. He always wanted, he said, the music to be becoming. That's true. He uh, had a, a, a well, I guess it's a, a weird scene for him. Every time somebody he loved very much uh, would get closer to him, and he'd get closer to them, yeah. this person would pass away. So he used to, Jonesy, one of the little, uh, uh, you know, the men that worked for him. Sure. He gave him all his clothes and, yeah. and things, and uh, Josie died. And uh, yeah. from that point on, he said he never wanted anybody to be that close to him to, to make him feel that sad. So. Well, know. that's what the music is, isn't it? It's always becoming. Absolutely. 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 There's a. Um, I saw something in an interview with you that reminded me that. I've talked to a lot of people who used to be in Ellington's band, yeah. and several said the first night they were a little nervous, and where do I come in, and what are the chords, and Duke always would say the same thing, listen, listen, sweetie, Absolutely. listen. And he was, was talking about how he believed in total listening. That was his pet, pet boy, listen, listen. I remember one time we played a concert in uh, Toronto, I think it was, and we were very, very tired. Sometimes they put a little too much on you for the time that you have to do it. Yeah. And uh, we were tired. Everybody was tired and sleepy and looking tired and sleepy. So, but usually in a case like that, when the, when the gig is up, you really do it, you know. Uh, when you, you, you know, you're, you're tired, but you're going to overcome that feeling. And you really play better and greater that way. So the band was wailing, and I remember specifically the, the different concert. And the band was cooking, and uh, the next, as quick as they could get the release out on the newspaper, they were saying the Duke's band was tired and droopy and so forth, you know. So one of them happened to come to Duke, and he came to the wrong person <laughs> to complain about his band. The cat said, man, the band sounds Tired. <laughs> so Duke said, the man is tired. But your problem is that you're listening with your eyes instead of your ears. <laughs> That's how I remember that piece. Yeah. <laughs> so I take it when you teach this whole idea of total listening, how do you get them to understand that? Well, it comes a lot of territory because if you listen, if a guy, uh, you know, a tune goes from C to to E, to D, well, if you listen closely, you'll find maybe sometimes the rhythm section might play C, C sharp, D, D flat, D before they go up, you know. So you have to listen at all times, you know, because you don't know what kind of surprises you're in for. Yeah. You're supposed to be prepared to accept all surprises. And uh, if you don't do that, you're going to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Ellington once said to me, he said, I, I don't want my audiences to listen to the structure of what we do. I want them to listen to Absolutely. the whole thing all Absolutely. at once. Yeah, and see, find out what it means to them. Yeah. And they'll find out if they don't listen, it's not going to mean anything to them. <laughs> yeah. But now, if they listen, it'll mean a lot more. I want to ask you about some, a, a group or a class, let's say, that was pretty much left out of jazz for a long time. Yeah. Uh, Wynton Marsalis, for example. He was a very good educator, yeah. but he's never, to my knowledge, had in his Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra a full-time woman musician. You know, uh, and I was when I was a kid, the, the players would say, well, you know, the chicks ain't got the chops. Yeah. What's your feeling about uh, this other class of musicians? Well, I think you can erase that. I just heard uh, Maria Snyder's group last night. They had a little girl trumpet player by the name of uh, Ingrid Jensen. Ingrid Jensen. Oh, she's yeah, got yeah. chops. She's got chops. Yeah. She was all over the place. 
<laughs> and I've known her for years. She's always had a beautiful child. I, I remember uh, years ago, I never listened to working in my group, and she's a marvelous, she was a marvelous yeah. musician. And my little drummer currently mm -hmm. is uh, Sylvia Quincott. And she, she's hard to beat, man. Can't find anybody that can play, can swing anymore than that, man. Yeah. So that's just a few of them. All, uh, uh, the girl, uh, senior Cl Clover Bryant, who used to be around here. She's out in California. Yeah, I know that, yeah. Yeah. I think they're showing some of her film here somewhere. Yeah. Doing this festival. I never heard, except on records, obviously, the Sweethearts of Rhythm. Yeah. Now, the legend is that by Burnside, the yeah. tenor player, could cut almost anybody. She could. Yeah. She really could, man. That was a great band. A fantastic band. Yeah. Uh, that's a part of jazz history that's only beginning to be that's covered true. to some yeah. extent. The Harlem Playgirls and, the, and the, that, that particular band. There were some good, good players in that band. And if you close your eyes and not listen with your eyes, you can yeah, listen. That's a, that, that, that applies very well to, yeah. to the old line, chicks ain't got no chops. That's wrong. Yeah. Uh, you've been asked this a lot of times, you know, where is the future coming from? Well, we talked about education, but one night between sets of the modern jazz quartet, I said to John Lewis, you know, when's the next Louis Armstrong, the next Clark Terry, the next Coltrane, where are they coming from? And John Lewis says, you know, it could be tonight in some club in Bulgaria right. with some kids doing something. You never know. You think so, that's possible? That's absolutely true. Yeah. Well, it's been proven. Uh, some of these things uh, put together groups nobody's ever heard of before. I remember the last time we were here, there was a kid from Italy. I don't even remember his name. Played alto. And I went to hear one number. And I stayed till afterwards, although he could hardly speak English, but man, could he ever play. Does uh, anybody happen to remember his name? Who is it? What did he say? <laughs> One person said. Francisco Capiso. Frank? Francisco Capiso. Has he got any records? Hey, hey. Who can we get? I was so surprised my life. He plays everything correct. He couldn't speak English, but he knew the, the, the jazz language. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, Jim Hall, mm -hmm. who's played all over the world like yeah. you have, he said, you know, I play with musicians who can't speak my language, right. but we get along beautifully when we Absolutely. play. Absolutely. That's, that's, the, <laughs> Absolutely. that's the liberating thing, among other things, about, about this music. Um, in terms of what's going to be at William Patterson, what do you envision as the, what kind of courses, what kind of... Well, I'll, t I'll tell you this, then. We have the course, which I'm doing right now, uh, once a week I meet with these kids, and we got the, a drummer, a bass player, pianist, a uh, tenor player, and a trumpet player, and a trombone player. Trombone player is here tonight. He's my assistant. Uh, and I think he's, uh, he's a great trombone player. I think that in time, uh, already they've started asking, the, the rest of the, the group in the music music department are asking why it is that they can't play with our group. Now it started out like this. I met a few of these kids and you know, we became very close and, yeah. and I love to hear young jazz being involved in involvement and I love to get, be involved with them. I love to hear them play and I love to watch them learn. So I made my home an off campus classroom, huh. and it was going so successfully, the kids were going back to the school and saying, man, this is, this is what we were here for, to learn how to play. So uh, the, the school finally decided to make me an adjunct professor. Now, I was doing this because I loved doing it. I wanted yeah, yeah. to do it, but I ended up being on staff, getting paid for something that, that I enjoyed doing. Yeah. You know? So I think that's great. And I think that eventually, what is going to happen is that already somebody has asked, two kids have asked, 
why can't we play with that band? We don't want it to be too outlandishly big and yeah, yeah, full of, because we don't want them to have to write charts after charts, you know. Yeah. We want the people to learn how to use the most valuable uh, uh, possessions, the, the ear. Yeah. We want them to learn how to do that and learn how to, to uh, put pieces together and intervals and, uh, you know, punctuations and so forth. And that's what uh, jazz is all about, you know. So it's going to be the <laughs> yeah. Clark Terry Graduate School of Listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's very important. Yeah. Um, one thing, I, you know, through the years, I've known musicians, my friend Charles Mingus, for example, mm -hmm. who were not very happy with what they read by so-called jazz critics. Yeah. What's your idea of... If you were teaching a jazz, somebody wanted to be a writer on jazz, mm -hmm. yeah. what would you tell him to do, aside from listening? <laughs> what would I tell him? The first thing I would tell him was, consult Matt Hentoff. I know you're a fair enough person to not ostracize and criticize, and you know, somebody who's trying to do something. Yeah. I got some, some students, who I've, I've had my drummer to tell me that I was the best drum teacher he ever had in his life. And all I do is try to fill in that which is happening right now and that which happened 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of stuff that happened that kids are overlooking, you know? Yeah. The things we call squash beat, and, you know, Charleston and all that kind of stuff, you know, the room board beat, and uh, the beats that they never heard of, like the beans, the bangs. Bing, bing, bang, tack a doo bum, to bum, to bum, bing, to bang, to bang, to bang. That's a swinging beat, man, in that temple. That ain't the word in the world you can be. But the kids overlook things like that. Uh, primary things that they, they should have known for years and years and years. But they skip way over that over to here. And I think it's important that they should know about that. Well, I happen to have been through that period, and uh, I can relate this to you. I know a little bit about drum, paradiddles and flats, you know, and, and five and stroke roll and six stroke, seven roll and all that, you know. So it, uh, it makes me come off to some of the kids like a great drum teacher. I'm not a great drum teacher. I just like to bring to their attention the things yeah. which happened before they came on the scene. And the valuable <coughs> things that they should know. You know, Duke wrote a song, it's one of my favorites, and for some reason it's seldom played. It's called, What Am I Here For? What Am I Here For? And when did you, going way back, when did you know what you were here for? What, what, what did you hear at how, at how young an age that made you where you are? Well, I'll tell you, my older sister was married to a tuba player. That's back in the days yeah. when they didn't use string bass. They yeah. did boom. That's the bass line went, you know. So uh, uh, um, I was a very young kid in, in school, and I used to listen to Sai, his name was Sai, practice. So I asked Sai to take me to the rehearsal. They rehearsed at the homes of various members of the ensemble, and the band that he played in was Dewey Jackson and his musical ambassador. And uh, one of the trumpet players, uh, Mr. Lattimore, all I remember was Mr. Lattimore was a big fat cat and he loved candy and he had a candy store. So he always had two pockets full of candy. <laughs> Both of which were my favorite types of candy, Carmel's and Mary Jane. So he'd always have a pocket of the Mary Jane's and his pocket of coal. So when they would take a break, he would give me a couple of bits of candy, here son, watch my arm. Until I get back, you know, so I'm happy to see him. And I'm so happy that he wasn't a banjo player. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he would uh, inspire me by just giving me that opportunity, you know. Yeah. So I don't know if it was the beginning of the question, but it's uh, all this fits, fits in line with uh, Do you remember what it was before? Oh, yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, Mr. Lattimore had a lot to do with persuading me to, to uh, play the trumpet because on one of the breaks they returned from, he, I was so magnetically drawn to 
his instrument because he was such a nice person. Yeah. So I was back there trying to, <laughs> trying to be huff and puff some notes out of So they come back from the break just in time. He was the first one back, just in time to catch me huffing and puffing on his arm. And he said to me, son, you're going to be a trumpet player. Huh. And I was stupid enough to believe it. How old were you? I was, I was uh, 13. <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> Maybe 12. Yeah. Now, you've done so much. Is there, are there any things you still want to do you haven't, you haven't had a chance to do? Well, I, I got, well, there's one chance I won't ever have uh, again. Now, I come from a very poor family, and I wanted to learn to play piano and, you know, uh -huh. and write. But there were no pianos in the area. You know, we lived in an area where there was nothing but a dump. <laughs> so we were lucky to be able to afford uh, food and clothing. So as a matter of fact, I used to, uh, the way I learned how to box was, uh, uh, my, I had more sisters who were older than me. And as time went, sisters got older, the clothes got smaller. The clothes came down. When it came down to me, it came from a girl. <laughs> so I had to wear bloomers to school in the high heel shoes, you know. <laughs> so I was pushing around in the school and, uh, and trying to keep up with the boys. And then one particular day, they played a game called Follow the Leader. And we had to run and jump over the fences, iron gates, and over cement fences, and the leap over holes and so forth. So in trying to climb over one of the iron fences one day, my pants got stuck on one of the pickets, you know, and ripped them off. And there I was with a pair of bloomers on. <laughs> so the cats started giving me a, oh, Clark has got all bloomers, Clark has got all bloomers. So, uh, and they, they just kept on for like a whole, so that's it. Yeah. And finally, the, we had a champion boxer in, in, in the neighborhood named Kid Carter. And this was a South St. Louis commander yeah. that. And Kid Carter was. And so he said, Tell all you kids come in there, I'm going to teach you all how to box. So the first thing we do when he woke up to you, he said, hit you right in the stomach. Just like that. <laughs> 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 and then he would say to you, tighten up, kid, tighten up, you know. So he told us all. How to box, and I became a very good boxer. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I was uh, almost in the, in the class at one time with Archie Moore, you know. And Archie used to tell me, "Man, you will be a champion someday." But I couldn't couldn't stomach all those licks upside the head. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, this is uh, one of the things that uh, that I uh, like to remember. Yeah. Now, Bill Jackson used to say. People say jazz isn't popular, but it's not on television. Now suppose public broadcasting system, none of the networks would do it, mm -hmm. decided to say, okay, Clark Terry, you're gonna have a series. What would you put on television? I'd have to really do some serious thinking about that and yeah. concocting of ideas and formulas and so forth and put on something, I don't know. They never gave Duke a, 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 a chance to do it. He had several ideas, you know. So I don't know what would be acceptable. You have to think of what would be acceptable. Maybe, maybe you could start with uh, your home being a classroom. A concert? No, just how you did it at William Patterson before yeah. you became a, an yeah. adjunct professor. Yeah. That might be worthwhile. Oh, yeah. And then you could expand from there. And then your alumni would come in, yeah. and that would take about 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, let's see. That's Maybe we ought to find out what all these folks want to hear from you. Lee, are, are you around with your microphone? Yeah. Lee Merber? Because if we do it this way, I don't think it would be uh, audible. Is Lee here? He's not, but I'll do it. Is he here? Lee Bergman, the editor of uh, jazz, publisher of Jazz oh, yeah. But we'll go on until he comes back. Cause it's okay. Nah. Pardon? I'll do it for Lee. Oh, you can do it? I can do it. Okay. <laughs> so the way we'll do it then is, um, I guess you, the way this is usually done, you raise your hand and 
he'll go over with the microphone and just ask Clark. I'll do that. Yeah. All right. I'll start out with Ms. Jacobs. Mm -hmm. This is my cargo life. Clark Perry uh, was an artist in residence this past summer at the Louis Armstrong Jazz Summer Camp in New Orleans. I'd love him to give us an idea of what he felt about the kids and how he enjoyed being in New Orleans and how important New Orleans is to the jazz scene. Now, who is this speaking of? Uh, Phoebe just, Jacobs. Uh, Phoebe Jacobs. Oh, Phoebe Jacobs. Oh, Phoebe's there. I didn't know She's that. Right Phoebe Jacobs. That's my baby. <laughs> she was the life force of jazz in New York. Go ahead. And yeah, elsewhere. She was, she was a great friend of Louis Armstrong. Oh, Louis yeah. Knew her when she was just a little baby. Yeah. And she, uh, she's just been on the scene all ever since. And yeah, well, she's, she's, just she's responsible at Beth Israel Hospital for the yes. Louis Armstrong. You were there. Yes, I was there, yes. Louis Armstrong Musical, Music Medical Therapy. It mm -hmm. goes from way when people, kids are being born all through yeah. the hospital. They're going to yeah. have a musician center and yeah. hospitals all over the world. Are she always surprised me. She says, she says to me all the time, Papa's watching over you. Yeah. Phoebe, you want to stand up so people can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember her question? The question. I think there are, you, no, you want to. Yes, I wanted to know, Clark, what you felt about the Louis Armstrong Summer Jazz Camp. You, we were honored to have you as an artist in residence. And you were in New Orleans, yeah. and you saw and heard some wonderful kids. What were your feelings, and how important is New Orleans to jazz? I think New Orleans is very, very, very important to jazz. And it wouldn't seem right for this world to be without New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it just happened that uh, maybe two weeks before the disaster happened, Katrina, yeah. was it? The Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. yeah. I was there. And we had the, the big uh, audiences of kids uh, with the little trumpet players this tall with big trumpet, trumpets hanging under their arms, you know. And it was so beautiful. It was such a thrill to work with them and to, to enlighten them in any manner that they could. Yeah. And they were, they were beautiful, they were very responsive, and they were determined and dedicated. And uh, one of the kids uh, is a, the, the trumpet player, he's the, sit, the son of a, one of the big time jazz uh, saxophone player, uh, Jordan, what's his name? Kid. Kid, Kid Jordan. Jordan. Kid Jordan, yeah. Oh, yeah. Marlon Jordan. And his son was Marlon Jordan, yeah. yeah. And he was one that was in the, the disaster. Mm -hmm. He stayed on top of the roofs for five days. Oh. He jumped from one roof to another, <laughs> going to the homes looking for food. Oh, my. Yeah, and he managed to, to survive. But thank God that Marlon is still with him. Because he's a marvelous little young trumpet player. Oh. And he was at the camp that we had. And it was just a beautiful thing. And the other kids said, uh, just like him, you know. And uh, what's the, the, the tenor player, from uh, clarinet player from Baton Rouge? Oh, Alvin Baptiste. Baptiste. Oh, yeah. Was in charge of, of, the, of the kids. Yeah. And uh, he said, man, I got some kids here that you won't believe. And he was right. They were unbelievable. It was fantastic kids. And it just did broke my heart when this thing happened. I guess it broke everybody's heart. But, uh, there were so many kids there that were just fantastic and just very, very well equipped to continue and uh, really... Uh, so you got no, no fear that there won't be an audience for this music in 20 years? Oh, I think they will. I think that they're going to... First of all, I think they're going to revive New Orleans because they've got people yeah. who are responding all over the world. Uh, Jackie, uh, Will, uh, what's Jackie's last name? Harris. Harris. Who? Jackie Harris. Jackie Harris. Yeah, oh, Jackie Harris. Yeah, she took a group yes. from the New Orleans musicians to Europe recently. And they got a program going all over the world where people are 
and uh, collecting the funds to reestablish the schools, and uh, so these kids can get back into it. Because <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a shame that it will make things look very dark for them, you know. Little Trump players like this, <laughs> Trump is yeah. playing, man. You look. Well, any well, any uh, other questions? Oh, we got my questions. Clark, can you uh, mumble for us? <laughs> Will I mumble? Can you mumble for us that you said? I can tell you a little poem. It is gone and bring the hack of the hole of me down its light, and it flings to spot its guys. But if we look hold it the hole they fling, but it's flint, and I got it down. Now, the fingers come with it, the hook is clapping off. There's a tune to going over the eagle, I don't know who leave them now. And it's blues, but they can't, they can't, they can't, but they go now. But seriously, if the flag is going over the hook, it's like they go over the eagle now. And if we ain't on the tongue, and it's on 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 and it's on. And if we keep talking like this, I might even get elected. <laughs> Jazz Festival in Cape May. When, oh, when Clark came to Cape May, he took, our jazz, uh, he took our Jazz Festival to another level. Oh, it's been very spiritual. You. We want to thank you, and you know we love you. You will thank you, Willie. You will be very much, you know, for everyone. Thank you. 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 Say hello, and that's when they're going to invite me back again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I promised you? What? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. Who are you? We won't go uh, any further on it. <laughs> Hey, Clark, this is Lisa Hiddle, and I was wanting to know how you're coming on writing your autobiography. Yeah. Oh, well, my, yeah. my part of it, it's finished. We started this uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and it's gone through four <coughs> people who passed away and, and give all the material back and give somebody up. And all of a sudden, I decided, my wife is a great writer, so why the heck should she do it? So she changed it over, and uh, she first had the concept of uh, doing it, talking about my family. But uh, I didn't particularly want to talk about what a schmuck my old man was. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I changed the course, and we went another route, and we finished it. It's already finished, but she has trouble wrapping up the little ends before she gives it to the publisher, you know. So you have to talk to her about that. I'm trying to answer her. <laughs> so last time I said to her, I said, would you go finish it? I don't know, so I don't even care when you get through with it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a publisher yet? Uh -huh. Is there somebody who's going to publish yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. My, my autobiography. Oh. Yeah. Because then I can see one of these big box sets of the music with the book. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely. That would be yeah. a book. <laughs> like a disc along with a, yeah. a little theory along with it. Plus, you'd have to have about 10 boxes, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here comes another one. Hi. Can you remember a funny incident of your playing days with the Duke? Can I remember what incident? A funny, can, can you remember a funny incident from your days playing with Duke Ellington? Well, any funny answer? I think I can think. There were not too many funny incidents to do because he's uh, pretty much a matter of fact type person, you know. But uh, let me see. I have to think about that a little bit. What was it like? I uh, talked to some of the sidemen. They say being in the section was an education in itself. Absolutely. Because of the way he wrote. Absolutely. And he once told me that when he started. 
He used to write for the strengths of the individual players because he knew their weaknesses. Absolutely. But then he said anybody could cut anything. But yeah. what was it like being in that section? Well, it was a, it was a remarkable experience because uh, he and Billy Strayhorn wrote things for the people which surrounded them. Yeah. You know? And this is just to give you an idea. You, you've heard a lot of Ellington music, and you've heard uh, the baritone saxophone play way up on the top. Oh, 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 and maybe Ben Webster, oh, yeah. the bottom. Well, this is one thing that uh, a lot of arrangers and composers had uh, difficulty pulling off. And then he had uh, this other thing. He had a Rex Stewart. Oh, yeah. Had a section, and he had figured out uh, the, the concert note D, which is trumpet E, he could somehow suppress his valve, his yeah. third valve, and make a yeah. along with the, oh, with the yeah. note, you know. Yeah. Duke liked that, you know. He liked that strict thing sometimes, you know. <coughs> so he found out, figured out a way that uh, he'd write, and the, the note would, the, the, your part would be, and then comes this one note that Rex has got. <laughs> that you can take uh, 15, uh, 16 musicians from another band, sit beside the Ellington band, and you wouldn't get the same, I mean, the excellent players, but you wouldn't get the same effect That's right. no, that, no. that Ellington, because he had surrounded himself with people that could extend his ideas, what he felt about the way a note should be played, the way a passage should be played. And one thing I learned from him is that, uh, uh, and from so Sehan, is that, uh, a lot of the, 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 the passages uh, that you hear, they might say, they do, they do, they do, they do, they do. there's a ghosting of some of the notes. Mm, you know, you swallow them. You know, done, done, done. So the accents and the language of itself. Uh, first, give you a little example. Uh, Mercer had the band at one time. Yeah. And uh, they were trying to play. Uh, Hall of Air Chaff, was that right? So they were playing it, and they played it like any ordinary band would play. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And then those were the accents, the, the, the four notes. Yeah. But uh, Strayers and Duke didn't, didn't think that way. Yeah. They, they thought in terms of, of uh, language. And the first one, two, the first three notes were da open, da open, be, 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 da open, be, be, be. That's why you couldn't hear no other band in the world play that too like that. Yeah. They would try to say da 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 la 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 la, and it ain't gonna work like that. You know? <laughs> it has to be da open, be, and this comes up to what we had figured out. The, the, my show, straight figured this out years ago. It's it's a it's a language. Or, or, or what we call it? Uh, we now refer to it as uh, doodling. But I'm sure it was on the scenes long ago because that's yeah. how we figured out. You, uh, you take the vowels A E I, but you don't say I. You say A ah, A E I O U, and they little out a little doodle. And then the second syllable uh, with the tongue at the top of the mouth. It's what the ghost did. They called it, mm. They will deal with that old 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 how much of an adjustment was that for you? Well, basically, between Basie and Duke. Yeah. Well, I've been often asked this question. Uh, um, Duke, of course, was far more intellectual as far as musical knowledge, etc., than yeah. Basie. But Basie had something that was uh, a little bit different, you know. He had something, a great inborn feeling for uh, jazz, you know. Yeah. And he knew about uh, tempos like nobody in the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's the name? That, uh, 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 
Neil Hefty. Who? Neil Hefty. Neil Hefty, right. Yeah, yeah. Neil Hefty wrote in the tunes uh, and uh, passed it out and played it. So he said, what do you think, Governor? And uh, basically that shit. He said, why? Well, you don't like the rain? Rain is okay. So what's wrong? Tempo. So he said, what do you think it should be? He said, and the two went, do, 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 do. Now this cat wrote it, he didn't go to the right tempo for it. If he didn't could be, do, 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 it would have been forgotten years ago. <laughs> but it's still a part of me. Basically, he had an uncanny uh, inner feeling for tempos and for the utilization of space and time, because he is uh, from his group in the beginning, like in Kansas City with Big and Walter Page oh, yeah. and uh, Papa Joe John and, uh, oh, yeah. and all, all the people who were in his first band. Uh, this came about from, from, from the habit of, uh, of socializing with his friends in the club, the Cherry Blossom. Yeah. A little tiny club with the biggest in this room. And, uh, he, they had a little gingham tablecloth. <laughs> Everybody who came in that joint to hear the band knew what basically drank. So they all had a table <laughs> taste on the table for basic. Mm -hmm. And he just play for bling, 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 and he'd say, hey, go! And he'd get up and go and greet them and have a little taste with them. Meanwhile, bigger than the Papa Joe said, ba doom, 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 bing, boom, back at it, until he comes back. He comes back and says, Bling, bing, 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 bing. Hey, Tom! Hey, Tom! <laughs> <laughs> Tom got his tape on the table. You know? <laughs> so, uh, this is the thing that taught us all about the importance of the utilization of space and time. <laughs> you mentioned space. Yeah. And Dizzy Gillespie once said to me, it took me practically my whole life to learn what notes not to play. Absolutely. So, yeah. when, when you teach, how do you teach space? Well, I teach them to, like an old joke that you used to say to us kids when we give you quarters, don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just as basic as that. That's right. Spread it out. And don't, don't try to say everything you know how to say in uh, one course, you know. You use the space and the time that we were fortunate enough to have learned from Basie. But my show was, uh, he and Strayhorn were we something else. They knew how to put together things. For instance, they would uh, put modern seconds together. Yeah. That was sometimes kind of unheard of as far as jazz was concerned. And they put together and make notes. It, it made you learn how to listen. You know what I'm Oh, he's out of tune. Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> if you listen closely, you find it very much in tune. But they knew how they knew how to do that, and they knew how to supply themselves with people who were aware and who knew how to do it. So it was a marvelous thing, you know. Yeah. So they're both very, very, very instrumental in uh, the perpetuation of, the of uh, jazz and uh, the colorations of sounds and so forth. Yeah. One other thing. This is one of the big debates all through the years. What is or who is a jazz singer? How do you determine whether somebody is singing what you would call jazz? <laughs> well, that's a very difficult question to answer because there are a whole lot of people who sing well and think they sing beautifully and they think they sing jazz, but they don't sing jazz. They say, they may even sing in tune, you know. <laughs> but uh, they, they really haven't learned the, 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 the inner things about jazz, like uh, like like instruments. You got to, you got to, like Ella Fitzgerald. She sang like a like an instrument, you know. Yeah. You got to, you got to know that there's certain notes that you can make in certain positions of the tongue and the mouth. But you can't do. Oh, you can't say hey, 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 for everything. You gotta say ooh la, ooh go, ooh la. You know. Yeah. You gotta learn how to, to, to cheat, swallow. You know, and breathe in the proper fashion, and use the tongue in the proper areas. You know, to get the sounds and the effects that are necessary 
to to deal with what in determining the jazz language. Now I know how to define jazz education. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh yeah, we got a ton of questions out here. So <laughs> okay. Clark Ross Gentilly from St. Louis. Who's that? Gentilly from St. Louis. Hey, Gentilly, with this doggy. Yeah. Just wanted to well, thank you for all the hours and things that we've learned from you. Thank you for being a good jazz ambassador, and thank you for being a good example to students oh, and a good you. role model. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, very fortunate in uh, the fact that uh, there's so many talented kids around that uh, nobody even helps them to get out of the doldrums, you know, yeah. work out of the shell. And it's not, well, there must be a lot of people, but a lot of people who don't give a damn, you know. They're just interested in what's in it for me. Yeah. And uh, I'm just fortunate and happy to be able to impart some of this knowledge uh, to, to the kids. And it's, it's all, it's, it, it goes back to the beginning, you gotta listen. And pay attention to what's going on. I, I have a, a grandson. I tried to make a trumpet player out of him. I made a trumpet player out of a few of my uh, family. A little trumpet player in Detroit named Joe, who plays great, beautifully. He just stayed at it and we used to whip his fingers and make him do that, you know. And he, he does that. But, uh, some of the kids, they just, they just don't listen. Now, I had a grandson who I tried to get a drum, to be a trumpet player, and he would sit at the table, and he's looking at the boys, buddy. Look at that, you just see what he did. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, I got to tell him, I said, man, put the horn away and enjoy a boys, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Um, I won't say my name because I'm just a messenger. And um, this brings me to the story of Noah and the Ark, right? Where there was a creation and there was a preservation of who God felt was real and a destruction of what God knew wasn't real. And jazz music has went to a creation. And right now, with Elders like Mr. Terry and all the rest, young and old, we are now in the preservation stage. And now what's getting ready to happen is a destruction of what's not real, what's out here trying to pose itself as jazz music. That will be wiped away and we will come to another era of, of what the roots of jazz really was. So I just want to let everybody in the sound of my voice know to keep on preserving because it doesn't matter the, all the other forces because God is going to take care of it the destruction is going to happen then there's going to be a renewing just like it was at the beginning and even better so I just want to say keep it moving and keep preserving yep. very good anything you want to add to that? Uh, oh, here we go, one more question another more question I was pretty profoundly laid down I think Say another question? Yeah, yeah, we got lots of yeah. Hi, I'm Danny Schur. I came to your house a few months ago and uh, interviewed mm -hmm. you for a documentary we're doing on the Heath Brothers. Who's the hero? Danny Schur. Who's Danny Schur? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a Heath Brothers documentary, but you told us a story about playing with Count Basie and trying to find rooms in places where, in, oh, where they wouldn't let you stay. Right. If you could oh, repeat yeah. that story. Yes, I think I remember that. Uh, do, do you remember how to guide me into that so I can remember exactly? Because there's so many things that happened in basic there. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, if you found rooms for everyone except for you and Basie. Oh, uh, yes. So, uh, we were, Alacorpa, Pennsylvania, I think it was. Did I say that to you? Somewhere in a little town in Pennsylvania. And the band had these five rooms, and you couldn't stay at the hotels. You had to stay at Miss Green's and Miss Jones and Miss Brown, you know. And so we hustled around. 
and got everybody. It was a small band, thank God it was small. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we got everybody, and then we look up, and Basie and I don't have a room. So <laughs> we went to this one place that was laid with the shade down here, and little science rooms. She peek it out from under the mirror, uh, under the shade, you know. And that's what he used to do with the rest of us. They see you coming and they tear up all the rest yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll make her more and put higher prices on. So she didn't look at it in that. And uh, so all of a sudden, uh, we go, go into this room. And she said, yeah, yes. Come on in. Uh, uh, well, we're looking for rooms. And we have no rooms for a band. I told them band. And we need two more rooms. So. Well, I don't have two rooms, but I got uh, an attic with a big bed in it and a little bed inside the wall. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, it is. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, uh, I so, said, so you can look at it. So we went up and looked at it. And of course, the price had been doubled, which you would ordinarily get in. And uh, so there's one big bed in the middle of the room, and there's a little slab on the side of the wall. So I know Basie's going to get the big bed and I'm going to get the slab. <laughs> so I knew that already. So just as uh, we ordinarily do when we travel, empty our pockets on the dresser. Yeah. So I do my pockets right there, and Basie put his, all this stuff right there. And we decided to take the room, in spite the fact that we knew we were being held up financially. So uh, we took the room, and Basie got in the middle of the bed, He's reading his favorite literature, comic book. Yeah. <laughs> so we all slept topless, and he's got his comic book out, and I'm up against the slab, up against the wall, the slab, and I had to, and he had the light on. And at that time, I couldn't sleep with the light on. You know, I had to have the light off, and he couldn't sleep with the light on. <laughs> so I said, I know what I'll do. I wait till he goes to sleep, and I'll sleep, go and turn the light off. So that's summer. Good, so you read.